Hello and welcome to Down to Earth, a podcast created by the environmental charity Hubbub. This season is all about fashion, because would you believe it, the fashion industry produces 10% of all carbon emissions and clothing production has roughly doubled since 2000. Alongside that, one garbage truck full of clothes is being burned or dumped in landfill every second. So we want to discover why we're buying so much and how our wardrobes impact the world around us. I'm Sarah Dival and I've been working in the environmental space for seven years, but I've always been a big shopper. I love fashion and I love new clothes. And however much I learn about what the fashion industry is up to, I still find fast fashion a hard habit to break. And I find it really difficult to know how to dress sustainably. I know I'm not alone in that feeling, so I want to bring you with me as we meet the designers, experts and change makers who unpick why our wardrobes aren't working for us and for the planet. Today, we're talking to Amy Powney, creative director of the fashion brand Mother of Pearl. She's a pioneer in the world of sustainable fashion and the star of a new documentary, Fashion Reimagined. As things developed, I realised the impact that fashion was having on the environment the chemicals involved, the sheer quantities of everything that we're making, the pollution off the back of it, the carbon emissions, the way the animals are treated, and it just goes on and on. I think if you ever just look at a product, you just have to realise it's came at a cost. It charts Amy's journey as a fashion outsider, working with a small, dedicated team to create a completely sustainable collection called No Frills. Amy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So my first question for the uninitiated, what is No Frills? Yes, yeah, so No Frills was a collection that I um, decided to try and create about five years ago, more now actually, about six years ago. It was basically a collection of core classics that I could trace their sustainability credentials kind of as far as they could go and do the best possible practices. Um, but really, No Frills was a concept originally, and then it was a deep dive into whether we could do it or not. And then finally, we actually made a collection, um, which has sort of subsequently become our core cool collection. Um, and then we infiltrated everything we learned on that on that journey into everything at Mother of Pearl. In the documentary, you say you want your collection to be six things. Organic, traceable, using minimal water and chemicals, socially responsible, considering animal welfare, and produced in the smallest geographical region. That's how you were going to judge how sustainable the collection was. And I wondered why you picked those things and why you thought it was a good definition of what a sustainable collection is. I mean, I don't I don't even like the word sustainable anymore, to be honest. It's just very hard to encompass what that actually means. So my kind of approach to sustainability is just very much like a, a mindset and a holistic approach and that's like across the business and supply chains and everything that we do but we wanted to work out um how traceable we can make the product so can we get it right back down to the um farmers or the field and um, what journey that garment is going to have gone on and how many kind of countries it's gone to um, and how could we minimize that as much as possible i need if we grow the cotton in a certain country can we produce it in, an, in that same country so it hasn't actually left um, and, and the transportation is low then we want to make sure it's we, we focus on natural fibers just because at the moment the issues around plastics the microplastics are very complicated and um, so we focus on natural fibers and um, so kind of how are they grown in terms of their organic farming methods um, and what the practices around that and then also what's the social responsibility around all of that so um, are people being paid a living wage and not just obviously you know, the factory workers, but what about the spinners, the weavers, the cotton pickers, etc. cetera. Um, so, yeah, we tried to look at the whole kind of supply chain of a garment and all the things that went into it and how could we do the best possible practice and minimise its, you know, kind of footprint. I was just about to say that that's what comes across most clearly in the documentary is that when you're trying to make this collection, it's not just about what you're doing, it's about what everyone else in the supply chain is doing, what a factory is doing with their wastewater, who are they subcontracting to? It seems like the chain goes on and on. And in 2018, at least, it didn't seem like it was very common for designers and brands to go and ask these questions to factories. So I was wondering, is the supply chain any clearer now? No, 
No, I mean, the, the very nature of fashion supply chains is complicated because it also is based on history and, and you know, global economics. And, you know, once upon a time we had a textile industry, but then it, it moved because it was cheaper to do it somewhere else. And then after that, it moved somewhere else. So, you know, there's a bit in the film where we find a great wool supplier. I mean, well, I guess a great wool farmer in Uruguay, but then we realise the whole entire industry doesn't exist for anything after that but it used to but it doesn't anymore because it was cheaper to send it over to China etc so we really have made this supply chain completely global based on kind of who was offering the cheapest produce at the time and that's just meant that it's such a fractured system and joining the dots is really complicated because then you're not just looking at transport you're also looking at import deals and and trades between countries and how different countries treat their workers and you know for instance we produce a lot in portugal because it's governed by the law and we can visit them and understand that they're you know a happy workforce but you know if you've got five parts of the chain in a garment and five of those are in five different countries what are the laws that govern the rights of the workers in those countries and and how do you vet that and also who has the motivation or even if there is motivation who has the resources and the time to do this work. I was reading your profile in The Guardian where you say that nothing is really sustainable, uh, which I completely agree with. And I'm wary of brands who you know, are putting big signs in their store saying that they have a sustainable collection or something's part of a capsule sustainable collection. And to me, it feels really hard to know when a brand is honestly trying to do better and when they're just making stuff up to try to buy more. Yeah, I mean, the truth is anything you make Whatever industry that you're in has a footprint. Like that is just, you know, if you make something, you have taken resources from this planet in one form or another. And then you basically have to choose how do you take resources in the best possible practice to leave as little kind of mark on there. But then also, what are you creating and how long is that going to live once it's out in the world? And then also, how do you make sure it doesn't end up, you know, back in landfill that quickly or doesn't break or, you know, because... If you think about sustainability, you need to think about your supply chain, you need to think about climate impact, you need to think about carbon, but you also need to think about what you're making, what's its purpose, and what's the longevity of that product, and how do you make it as robust as possible. Denim, for instance, has a bad rep because of obviously it's got harsh dyes, it's got hard washing, cotton is a very thirsty, pesticide heavy crop if you grow it in conventional ways. And I agree with all of that and cotton is complicated, but at the same time, a denim garment, like the history of a denim garment and the way it's double stitched and the fact it has like rivets and it was designed to last. So you have to, in order to truly call yourself, let's say not sustainable because nothing's sustainable, but a sustainable thinker, I think it's just a whole 360 approach to everything you're doing. So any brand that's just making a capsule collection and stopping at that, that's not a sustainable brand. A brand that's making a sustainable capsule collection to learn from it, to infiltrate into the rest of their business, that's a sustainable brand. So I would say sustainability is just purely a philosophy rather than a tangible product. Does that make sense? It does. And do you think that that's a philosophy that more brands are starting to pick up? What is the space like now in comparison to when you made the documentary in 2018? I think people want to do better. And I think people feel like they have to do better now. But I think it takes a massive amount of commitment and a complete change of approach to your business. And I don't know, and this just goes across humanity as well as brands, but I guess you have to ask the question of, are people willing to sacrifice or change for the greater good? And I think it's that hurdle that we have to get over. You know, for me, it was like change or stop. I'm interested as well in what brought you to fashion in the first place. It seems like you've got like wide stretching interest in a lot of different places and I guess fashion isn't the place where most people would consider huge environmental and social action taking place but that's what you're doing with Mother of Pearl um so yeah what what brought you here? To be honest I, I kind of got here by accident as in as a child all I wanted to do was you know art and design I knew that I knew I was going to take a creative career that was my pure passion very instinctual and fashion because textiles was something I was enjoying in my art foundation courses but also I got quite obsessed as a young child and sort of coming from a very working class background my social status without good clothes and when you wore a specific brand or a logo or whatever kind of you know the subcultures around that 
the playground of what what meant what based on what you looked like and I think I came a bit obsessed with that because I was kind of the opposite of that but then I managed to change the way I looked and when I changed the way I looked I was you know allowed into certain social situations in a different way so I think I became quite obsessed about appearance at that point in my life so I guess that's where the two things kind of merge um and then here I am you know 38 in the industry um it's not a natural fit and I'm not a natural fit in a way but I guess maybe that's what makes me the right person to try and change it absolutely and do you think you know we're five years on from that documentary mother of pearl is a much bigger business you've already made lots of sustainable collections um, other brands are starting to copy what you're doing. Do you think it's going to be a case that new legislation is going to come in and change the fashion industry? Do you think it's going to be that the public start demanding change and so we see greater change across the fashion industry? I think all of it needs to happen and all of it needs to change. I don't know what's going to come first. I know legislation isn't anywhere near where it should be. So in that case, consumers need to change quicker because we've got the, the power to change tomorrow. Um, so there are conversations, it is happening. I don't think it will happen quick enough as everything to do with governments and politics. Um, I don't think anyone's acting in those positions of power as fast as they should be. So I think we have to work on it and it's something I'm passionate about and you know, want to spend more time trying to work on a legislative side. Um, but yeah, we have power as people and I think we forget that. I mean, I think you know, the government's trying to stop protesters and, you know, I mean, that whole thing is just so messed up. And, you know, I think it's making people sit back and not fight. And actually, I think we have so much power ourselves. You know, people aren't relating, you know, clothing to climate change. I just don't think that they're like, it, it, why would you? You know, you walk into a shop, you see a dress, you want to wear. They don't connect to climate change and they also don't connect it to like the farmer. You know, if you buy a cotton dress, you don't, connected to agriculture the same way that we do our food and that is the same like agriculture and natural products in terms of fashion and clothing fi fibers comes from the same place like the issues that you face in cotton farming as what you face in you know industrial farming of meat and you know of vegetables and, and I think that makes it really complicated and I think it's too, so many degrees of separation in a way from from the reality is that that people haven't connected the dots. And I guess that's that's the noise we need to make. Yeah, I always completely agree. I've been working in the environmental space for seven years now. Um, and I thought going into watching the documentary that I knew a lot about how supply chains worked. Um, and I think what it really highlighted is how vast the whole system is and how difficult it is to really make change. I guess for me, it just, it raised a lot of the questions that I should be asking myself, like, what is this made of? What country was it made in? Do I really need it? Am I going to wear it again? All of those questions that I find it easy to stick to the back of my head when I'm getting ready for a party and I just really want to post something new. I think that's the most, a lot of people, um, I get a lot of them, not backlash, no one's been that cool to me, but and, you know, I get a lot of people say, yeah, but, you know, Mother of expensive. And it's never about that, you know. It's not about my, buy my brand. This film isn't about buy my brand. This is just about buy better. But the truth is, like, the thing that everybody can do tomorrow is just buy less. And and question what you're buying, what you want it for. You know, are you going to wear it over and over again? Is it going to be part of your core wardrobe? And however you dress aesthetically, it doesn't have to mean that it's black and minimal. It means that... What, whoever you are and however you wear it, like just ask yourself, do you love it? And are you going to wear it over and over again? And I think if the answer's no to any of that, that's when you have to just put it back and don't don't buy it. And if you do find that you've bought something and it doesn't fit anymore, you've decided you've fallen out of love with it, you know, don't put it in the bin. There's a, a place to sell this stuff, you know, and we've seen marketplaces now are, are incredible to, to resell. Um, and I think it's getting out of the habit of when people buy cheap, they just throw it away. And I think... You have to remember, even if you've bought something cheaper and you don't feel that emotional connection to it, like it's not waste. Like, tr like our bins shouldn't be filled. They should be empty by the end of the week, you know, because we, should, we shouldn't we should be creating the waste that we're creating and especially not in clothing, you know? Do you think that there's room in that for a relearning of skills? Like people used to be able to make mend and repair a lot more of their own clothes. We're looking at a generation, two generations ago. So... Even if you buy something cheaply on the high street or at the supermarket and it gets a tear or a hole in it, I think we're more likely to just chuck it away now because we've lost that skill level. 
yeah, hundred percent. That's completely gone. I mean, you know, I remember my mother, and my grandmother, like men did a thing today. You would, you wouldn't throw something in the bin because things were expensive. Like clothes are cheaper today than they've ever been in history. So that's the, and it's the only thing. Like everything else has, you know, got more expensive with inflation and the cost of living. But clothes are cheaper today than they've ever been. So the relationship to that idea, like of mending, why would you mend something that's cost so little money and throw it in the bin? But if you stop thinking about your garments as the financial cost to you. I mean, obviously, we need to change this stuff because like, we shouldn't be able to make things that cheaply. If you remove the financial cost and think about the true cost of it, you wouldn't throw it away. If, you, if you'd have met the people that had met, made that garment on the way and you'd seen what their lives have been like and you'd have seen the impact, you know, maybe don't think of the cost of it as the number. Think of the cost of it as the carbon that, that it's created. You wouldn't throw it in the bin. You, know, you would respect it in a completely different way, even if it was a polyester high street dress. I used to shop a lot and I shopped fast fashion a lot, even though I worked at an environmental charity because I wanted new things and I wanted to feel nice. And maybe I felt some social pressure, especially you know, when I first moved to London and I got a new job and I wanted to fit in and look like everyone else. And there's a huge pressure to buy something new and to look like other people that you see every day. This year, my news resolution is to not buy anything new only to buy second hand and it's shown me how often when I get bored I just like drift onto a fast fashion website I'm getting advertisings on Instagram all the time because I drift onto those pages um and actually we were talking about the fun of fashion and the fun of this uh limitation for me is that I've had the chance to wear loads of stuff in my wardrobe that I completely forgot I had there's so much stuff I probably would have chucked away I bought four years ago and just stuffed into the back of my wardrobe and never looked at it and now that I've pulled everything out I can see you know the beautiful things that I now have a chance to wear again and finding a way to enjoy what I already have and resist the urge to buy something new all the time. I also find often in the past and even today sometimes like why in clothes sometimes because I'm not feeling very good about myself for one reason or another you know and actually, I found that the best way to make me feel better wasn't ever really about the clothes. It was about actually when I eaten better, exercised more, felt stronger, felt mentally better. It was never really the clothes were just trying to mask or trying to put a sticky plaster on, maybe me not feeling my best self. And actually, when I worked on all the other stuff, like make sure I slept, make sure I ate well, you know, been to done exercise, actually, my dress that I already had suddenly felt nice again because it wasn't really ever the dress that wasn't nice in the first place it was more I wasn't feeling great and I don't know how many other people out there feel like, like that but um, sometimes I think that is the true way to feel your best I mean I'm not saying everybody is out there is like that but that was just a journey that I've gone on and kind of realized don't buy clothes to make you feel better when the truth is it's actually something else you need to work on it sounds like what you're talking about is a sea change there's a personal shift that has to happen inside our heads to make a decision to be more sustainable. And that change has to happen within each individual person before we can all make a collective change, or at least maybe a better way of saying that is, you know, I can change myself in a way that I think is more sustainable and that might influence the way another person thinks and they might be interested in making a change and so on and so on. Yeah, and actually, like, you know, this, uh, don't get me wrong, like, I'm not perfect. You know, I've had very low times in my life, you know, with even being a mother, I didn't have the best experience my first child. And probably in hindsight, when we were in lockdown, probably maybe had, you know, depression. I don't know. But, you know, at that t time, she didn't sleep. And I would be lying if I wasn't on Amazon, you know, every bloody night trying to buy another sleep aid to make a sleep because I was like at rock bottom. And, you know, there was there was packages coming through my door. Like that's not obviously I'm not saying that anyone's perfect. We go we go through these stages in our lives. But I guess the happiest I am is when I feel like I wake up. I feel like I'm going to work to do something better than doing something worse. And I wake up and I feel like I'm living my life in a more kind of sustainable way. It makes me enjoy my life better because I don't feel you know, I feel positive and I feel like I'm part of the solution, not part of the problem. And I'm not saying that that's every week, but I do I do think there's something to be said for your mental health when you're in the spirit of, you know, slowing down your life and thinking about it more and making better choices. I think it makes you happier. Maybe that's just me. I don't, I don't know. But I wanted to ask you a question 
just at the end of the documentary, there's a stat that really shocked me. And it said that um, the industry is set to increase by 63% over the next seven years. And the documentary seems to end on quite a hopeful note, but that seems like a completely enormous and unfathomable increase. So are you hopeful about the future? Well, honestly, like I go through phases. Some days I feel hopeful, some days I feel deeply unhopeful. And I read something recently an activist had said, which is we've got to stop saying that it's just, it's done, it's over, and, you know, no one's going to change because that's just not going to motivate anybody to do it. Um, humans kind of start making, I think humans are more empowered to change where they feel inspired to change, not rather than doomsday's coming. And that I think a lot of people then just kind of like sort of hide away and just accept defeat. Yeah, I think it's a roller coaster of a ride mentally to go down. Um, but I think actually in these times when it is quite dark, when you read, you know, kind of what's going on and the information out there. I tell you what, the, the, what it is, is when I follow people that are doing things right, you know, if I'm listening to Russell Brand and, um, you know, following activists and hearing what they're saying, you know, and looking at what Earth Rise are saying and um, meeting and having a nice, you know, exciting positive meeting with another company or organization or activists that are doing the things I feel better and then when I go into a room of people that I'm trying to change that don't want to change I feel utterly depressed so I think surround yourself with the people that are doing things to make change and don't surround yourself with the people that aren't and that will hopefully give us give you or us the hope to you know keep doing things better and and I guess we just can't admit defeat right now you know even if some days it doesn't feel good like it's now is not the time to sit back now is the time to stand up yeah and my final question that i have for you that we asked everyone is what is one big change that you think could happen in the fashion industry tomorrow that would have a really big impact and what's one thing that you think that people at home listening right now could do to make a change yeah so one thing in the industry that needs to change is legislation so there is a big um act um uh, happening in america I think, I think it's called New York Fashion Act. I can't remember. Actually, if you go on the Fashion Reimagine website, all the legislation things um, are on there. But there is one that, uh, that's going through at the moment or being discussed, which is um, companies trade. And I think it's over 10 million have to trace, uh, map out 40% of their supply chain, something like that. It's more complicated than that, but it's huge. Like for big businesses, that is huge. And um, so I think if something like that passes, then that would be hopefully the kind of ripple effect that we need because what you've got to remember the, the real complexity about fashion is the global supply chain because we have to navigate economics and politics and, and global issues but what makes the global part great is that if somebody puts out a legislation change in a country because everybody trades with that country in one way or another in fashion you know every big brand here or in italy or paris or whoever sells in new york they're going to have to change the way that they do things if they want to trade with that country. So basically, you know, what's great about the global supply chain is that if we all trade internationally, so if somebody makes some decisions in one country, potentially we're all going to have to change because we're trading with those countries. So I think if we can see legislative change like that, that would be incredible. Um, and then one thing you can all do at home is, as Vivian Westwood says, buy less, buy better. Okay, time for a quick debrief. I really hope you enjoyed my chat with Amy Powney from Mother of Pearl. If you haven't seen it already, you can catch her documentary, Fashion Reimagined, which is available on Sky Documentaries and on the streaming service now. I think what I took away from that conversation is that whatever budget you're on, there's something that we can all do to extend the life of our clothes and to make our wardrobes more sustainable. It's not about having to buy the most expensive thing it's really about falling in love with what you already have making sure that we take care of it the best we can and really thinking about when you do buy something new what's gone into making it if you've been inspired to make a change or if you're already making one we would love to hear about it you can find me on my email sarah at hubbub.org.uk or you can find us on all the usual socials and if you're quick enough, we might even read it out on the next episode. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast was presented by me, Sarah Dival, created by Hubbub and produced by Annie J.